Buongiorno a tutti e benvenuti. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. Many of you have accepted the invitation to participate in this event, and I thank you very much on behalf of Anfia, which I remind you is the National Association of the Automotive Sector and of the group of car makers and designers. So thank you very much for the great enthusiasm that you've shown for this initiative. It is the result of a joint effort of all associates. Our desire is to state how important design is for the economic future of our country. We are going through a very difficult time, a crisis, and abuse term right now, but really it is also synonym with great opportunities. So at this uncertain time, filled with changes, most uh, companies in all industrial sectors are deeply rethinking the way they go to the market in order to transform this crisis into opportunities, opportunities for growth, opportunities to deeply rethink their business, and an opportunity to open up to new markets, in brief, in order to create disseminated well-being. We, as um, body workers and designers, we believe that, that design and maintenance products can play an important role during the recovery of our country, which we hope will happen very soon. Designers have the opportunity to continuously innovate, improving the life of people at normal times, so they can surely give an answer uh, and try and imagine a new future. More specifically, in our sector, car designers must start from their own core business, the automotive sector, which in itself uh, is being uh, deeply rethought. And they have to imagine the mobility of the future, which is going to be very different from the current one. It will be more sustainable, more inclusive, and also the source of greater individual experiences. Most In recent years, car sharing has grown to the detriment of individual ownership. But what is going to happen now? just after the pandemics. Uh, public transportation will have to use new technologies in order to psychologically comfort passengers and create virtual spaces within the public space. Uh, otherwise, passengers will feel uh, unease when they travel. So generally speaking, it will be about reassuring people in all the realms of their daily life. Sticking to car design, it will be helpful to nurture multidisciplinary experiences from architecture to interior design to designing experiences. So the combination of experiences and skills will allow companies to strengthen their position in, in the automotive sector and open up to untapped sectors. In order to keep up the pace with changing times, we will need new technologies as well, and most importantly, of new professional figures who are able to push even further our imagination. That's why the borders between car design and non-car design will be more and more blurred. Physical design and digital design are converging more and more towards designing an experience. So car designers must open up to new realities that uh, significantly influence the concepts of cars or vehicles. I think of mobility service providers or platforms or the interaction between man and machine, digital design. Car designers must listen to the needs that come from different yet similar worlds such as uh, fashion, uh, uh, technology, information and communication. The evolution of uh, the sector will uh, bring us to electric, uh, connected, autonomous uh, vehicles. This will make the role of the uh, of research and development, they will have an even further role. There will be a glue between uh, producers of cars and components because some of the aspects of a vehicle, let's think of interiors, will need to be radically redesigned. So we have invited here to think about these topics some of the most prestigious people in the world of design and technology. I thank Chris Bangle a world-renowned car designer, and I am also a very good friend of him. I've known him for a long time. I thank him for accepting to coordinate in the dialogue with Stefano Boeri, the president of the Triennale di Milano, and a celebrated artist, Mr. Roberto Cingolani, a physics researcher, and also behind the innovation of Leonardo, world leader of high tech, and on Nico von Zaurma, a designer whose ideas create products that are with us at every moment of our daily lives. Soon we will have the pleasure of listening to the death of their thoughts and considerations. Finally, we'll have Giancarlo Mazzella, undersecretary, 
always paid attention to the needs of design and the relevance of made in Italy products. I thank you very much for being here with us. In light of what we've said so far, the group of body workers and car designers of Anfia wants to open up to other uh, industrial design sectors. We want to be a guide and a link among all of them. We want to uh, promote uh, shared and joint uh, efforts. We represent 350 companies in the automotive sector. Uh, we have a dialogue with private and public institutions, national and institutions. In these institutions, our goal is to promote and strengthen their competitiveness, their growth on foreign markets, and we also want to support integration mobility systems. Let's not forget that the automotive sector represents about 6% of the Italian GDP and employs about 150,000 people. In particular, uh, our group includes 23 companies that work in the field of designing, engineering, style and design of uh, cars and components for the automotive sector. We are a small group, yet we have contributed to writing the history of the automotive sector in the world and we still do it. On the back of our skills, we want to become the link between companies, public institutions, uh, training and education uh, institutions and universities in order to contribute to the training of resources that uh, are suited to the current times. We are lacking some of these figures. Sometimes we find it difficult to find the right professional figures on the market and we want to contribute to training them. We want that's why next, uh, in the next few months we will organize the uh, mobility hackathon with the involvement of universities and design schools. Today we launched our website for the hackathon. It is a contest that is open to all designers and students in the world. Right now, at this time of change, at this unprecedented time of change, it requires innovative solutions to create more efficient uh, mobility systems that are more eco-friendly and safer. We will explore, thanks to this hackathon, how new technologies can play an important role in building new solutions uh, to face the challenges of mobility and urban transport. Participants will be asked to design, create and demonstrate solutions that can improve the relationship between technology and usability and see what impacts alternative mobility models will have in the future. We will find shared and connected cars where the concept of driving will have to be combined with simplicity and usability. As an association, we also want to participate in the debate of the civil and political society on the important issues of the Industry 4.0 and the Internet of Things. We want to be the flag of Italian design applied to our sector in a wider market scenario with the fluid liquid borders. The goal of our association is that of joining our efforts towards a common goal while preserving the uh, individual personality of each and every one of us. The peculiarity of Italian designers in the automotive world is renowned in the world. But today we have to face uh, challenges that come from different worlds than uh, the automotive sector. Uh, they present uh, skills that we as car design, uh, designers sometimes are lacking and that's why we need to create a system and profit from the competitive advantage that we have, which comes uh, from a system of disseminated education. We have excellent uh, universities such as the Polytechnics. We have a high concentration of design compass in Italy where we we have a high production of made in Italy products such as Lombardy, Piedmont, Emilia Romagna, but also Marche, Tuscany, Campania, Lazio, Sicily, in brief, all Italian regions. We cannot uh, uh, empty the concept of design from its value. We need to recognize the ability of Italian companies to be creative. We are here to state once again that design has a core role to play. The automotive sector has a core role to play play. It is renowned all over the world and that's not just because of past success. We can also be a driver for the future change of our country. We need to promote a more general development uh, within the Ministry for Economic Development. We want them to support uh, politics and policies for design. I've always believed that in Italy we should have a Ministry for Design and Made in Italy products. Maybe the time has come for this to happen. 
Design it doesn't just play an important role for the economic future of Italy. It has a fundamental role to play in our everyday life. I'm thinking of eco-friendly mobility, the architecture that makes life better. I'm thinking of everyday job objects that are all around us. Design gives meaning to every gesture and moment in our lives. In other words, design makes the world a better place. Thank you very much. So now I give the floor to Chris Bengal and I wish you all a very successful and interesting roundtable. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Silvio. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Anvia, for this opportunity. Thank you for giving me the chance to chair a small roundtable with three colleagues from design, sciences, and technology who are uh, uh, renowned all over the world. And they are, I believe, the right people to give interesting inputs on these topics, the topic of design, not only the design of the future, but design for the future of Italy. And you can hear from my accent that it is very important for me because I am not Italian but I live here so it is very important for me of course the design in Italy is key now I have here with me today three colleagues of mine I'd like to see if they are all connected let's show their faces here they are first and I would like to thank him immediately is Roberto Cingolani Roberto Cingolani is the chief technology and innovation officer of Leonardo he took up this role in September last year, but I've known him much more in his uh, role as director, founder and director of Fondazione Istituto Italiano di Tecnologia, which uh, is very important in developing science and uh, technology in Italy and in Europe. Before that, Mr. Cingolani worked at the Faculty of Engineering at the University of Lecce, where he was a professor. And he also worked for the Max Planck Institute. It's such an impressive CV, sorry for maybe stumbling upon some of your titles, an impressive CV. He's also a doctor in physics, but I know him much more as a someone who loves design and comic books as well. He also loves robots, and I share this passion with him. Now, Roberto, welcome, and thank you very much for participating in this roundtable. Thank you, thank you, Chris, and good afternoon to all our... And now we have Stefano Boeri. Stefano Boeri is an architect, and he is also architect and urban planner and president of Fondazione Triennale Milano. Welcome, Stefano. Thank you, thank you very much, and welcome to you all. Thank you. I'm happy to hear that you're also, you also work for the Polytechnic of Milan, and you've also worked for many other international universities. You've also been director of the Future City Lab and Tongji University in Shanghai. I've been at these two universities, and that's very important. So congratulations for this experience. Since November 2018, you've been the co-chair of the Scientific Committee for the First World Forum on Urban Forests. And now you are the president of the Forest Scientific Committee. So thank you, thank you very much, Stefano Boeri, for being with us today. Thank you. The third guest that we have with us today is an old colleague of the times I spent at BMW, Nico von Zauma. Nico, welcome. Nico will be uh, in an English translation. Oh, sorry, I have to give a little time here. We have a, a time dilation here. When I speak in Italian, there's a bit of a translation. When I speak in Italian, there's going to be a translation, and then we'll have Nico reply, so there might be a little bit delay. Let's say that he's on a different planet, on planet Saturn, when English is spoken. So we might have a few seconds of delay. But uh, other than that, communication should work. You see a little delay. I have to juggle between microphones and and on off, so it will take me a few minutes to to figure out. <laughs> okay, Nico has uh, un, uh, he's a designer, laureate uh, dalla stessa scuola che fatto we are center in America. Nico is a designer. He graduated at the same university where I graduated in the United States. He spent most of his career 
at BMW in the United States, where I also worked in my previous life. I knew him when he also founded the Munich Studio of Design. I think it was his first job at Sound University. I think that's what he did in Germany. And he did his career and also founded the... Uh, he worked uh, uh, for DNW in Singapore and now is head of style of design in Munich. That, that again, he worked for BMW in Munich, and then he went to Swarovski, where he was head of design for Swarovski. After a couple of years at Swarovski, Nico took on his current role as vice president of design at Bosch and Siemens households. So, welcome, Nico. Thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction. <laughs> We'll find out if I got it all right later. Okay, so, signori, grazie mille. Well, thank you very much. Now we have a very interesting topic to talk about today. I promise I won't speak too much, and I would like to start from you. So I'm going to ask you to give us a little background on the topic. I've asked my speakers not to use slides or presentations. I think that this will make things much more interactive and real. But I am going to show a slide or some visual aid, and here we go. That's just to remind you all that design is right at the center of many, many other things. You see, we have the customer up here and consumers, but around design, we also have the context where customers and clients are located. There are two different things. We also have an industry that has to produce what design produces, and we have governments that are involved from start to finish. And also, last but not least, we have technology and science. Without the input and the progress of technology and science, things cannot progress. So the three speakers we have today come from a background that has to do with all these elements. And so I would like to remind our audience that we are not just going to talk about style, cars, and design, but we're going to talk about a lot of complexity. and. Uh, we're going to discuss how this complexity will help the growth of Italy and the rest of the world as well. So I'll give it to you for a short background and then I'll start with some questions. Stefano, can I ask you to start, please? Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I am talking as an urban planner and as an architect. I'm interested in some aspects that have to do with the future of uh, cars and of, uh, mobility vehicles. Uh, there are some paradoxes that I see. I think, first of all, for those who work in the field of design, to think about the sharing economy, you know, the fact that today sharing, especially in the field of mobility, has an important role. I think of cities, of cities in Europe, uh, not just in the UK and France, but all over Europe. Car sharing has become very important. But at the same time, there's also a need not to lose the opportunity to customize your own car or your uh, mobility space. We all know very well that there is a very strong symbolic value in having your vehicle that sort of represents uh, symbolically who you are, what your identity is all about. So this is the first point that I believe is very interesting. We might think of a system of vehicles in the future that are shared, but at the same time, these vehicles are able to adapt to our taste, to our need to express our identity, while they move from the sharing dimension to the temporary ownership when we drive them. A second paradox that I see has to do with the automation and individual freedom. That's something that we will have to discuss to understand what can happen in the future. Automation is developing with some issues, but it is growing. But we need to think to which extent are we willing to accept automation and when do we want to introduce a possibility for individual arbitrary control or sudden control on our mobility tools and how does this change when we drive in a city or outside a city where I believe uh, sharing will not be that relevant, but uh, ownership will still be important. A last aspect that I'm passionate about is the relationship between uh, the vehicle and the home, the house. We are working on this. So, for instance, 
vehicles that no longer use fossil fuels but are based on electricity, well, these vehicles are becoming a sort of appendix to the house and they can play an important role. Uh, Roberto knows all about it, so he can tell us what it means uh, in uh, complex terms uh, to have, you know, domotic systems, etc. But if we talk about energy, this relationship is key. We might even think at one point of a situation where a part of a house becomes a vehicle, so we can really uh, think of this sort of uh, system, which this sort of goes against uh, sharing, and uh, let alone all the important aspects uh, that this entails in terms of freeing up parking spaces in the cities. I mean, these are just a few points. I would have many, many other things to talk about. Thank you, Stefan. We'll come back to these points later. I've taken some notes. When I ask questions, I am sure that we will have time to come back to these uh, topics. Now, I give the floor to Roberto. Roberto, uh, we'll have to go, I won't just say it for our audience, uh, he has a phone call with the government, so we'll have to leave us at 4 o'clock. I hope it will be a very positive uh, phone call, so give a good answer, whatever they call us, but give good answers for all of us. Uh, so he'll have to leave us for uh, some time, so let's explore all minutes. Uh, Roberto, what is your take on these topics? Well, you know, I have a background as a nanotechnologist, so for me, design, apart from being a lover of cars and motorbikes and bicycles and mechanics, but to me, design is essentially, in technical terms, something that has a lot to do with function. In my experience as a scientist for 25 years has been that of building artificial objects with atoms that Mother Nature normally doesn't use in order to obtain functions that otherwise cannot be obtained. This is what nanotechnologists do. There are two models right now. The natural model is the one that's developed a solution called simplexity. In other words, how to simplify complexity. And we as human beings are... Uh, a perfect demonstration of simplicity. We are optimized systems. All living beings are um, built with only six atoms, uh, hydrogen, calcium, oxygen, uh, some salts, and not much more. With these six atoms, uh, we've been able to become very effective, consume little energy. We have enormously adaptive systems, and we are programmed to support our species. But to do so, the architect, nature, or for those who believe in it, God, has taken 3.5 billion years. So, of course, it's been a very long optimization process. When we talk about design in technology for, let's say, a car, we want to do the same. We want to improve performances, reducing consumption, and creating an adaptive system that is suitable to all environments and that can be sustainable over the long term. So, after all, we are talking about design and we are doing an evolutionary process. Nature is taking its time. We don't have 3.5 billion years, though. But what makes the difference right now, and this is particularly true in the last 10 to 15 years, is that we can accelerate this evolutionary process and we can make very complex things simple, combine design and functionality using a tool that nature has never had so far, namely simulation. Nature has tried all possible paths and then the strongest one, the dominating species has survived and others disappeared. We do something that is completely different because we are able to simulate in a more and more accurate way any object, any complex product, and the automotive sector has been a pioneer in this. Now I'm building aircrafts and I have the problem that I have to create the digital avatar of my planes because if I create the digital twin of a complex system like an aircraft, well, then I can measure, I can study this object without actually building it, without waiting to find the best solution. I can simulate all possible scenarios, shapes, materials, interactions such as friction, aerodynamics, the virtual interface, and in the end I can uh, create a system that's been simulated simulated so accurately that once I build it, it's probably very, very close to the optimized end product. Now, why can we simulate? 
Well, it's a process in power that is quite extraordinary. If you think that when we landed on the moon back in 69 with the Apollo shuttle, the computer governing the landing module had a power of about one million binary operations per second, so it was basically like this smartphone. Well, today, we wouldn't uh, step on an aircraft uh, governed by a computer with the intelligence of a smartphone. We want much, much more. But uh, now we are working with machines which are much closer to one billion of billions of binary operations per second. And here there's an interesting uh, equivalence with what nature has uh, done with simplexity and what we can do. Why we talk about artificial intelligence? Well, because today the human being, if we wanted to reproduce a human being in all their fundamental features and with all their optimization, which is the result of 3.5 billion years of evolution, we would need one billion of billions of binary operations per second. We're almost there. We are beginning to have a real opportunities of simulating extremely complex objects. And from now on, design, function, the ability to adapt, and uh, even the ability to imagine things that nature has never been able to produce is becoming very real. So we have uh, huge uh, uh, motorways and pathways for designers and people who are imaginative. We can find solutions that 10 years ago were unthinkable and impossible. I think that this is a time of great opportunities for those who work in design, but we even go beyond design. It's a new simplexity made with the other 100 elements of the periodic tables, not just the six atoms of living beings, but also the other 100 that we haven't been able to use that effectively so far. Thank you, thank you, Roberto. You didn't mention one thing that you said to me before. I hope we will come back to this later on, but uh, I know that you believe a lot in the concept of creative DNA, which a country like Italy, I mean, has a certain advantage in a way, because we have maybe a sort of predisposition to develop certain things on a more disseminated basis. I will talk about it later. OK, great. So now we'll hear our third voice from Nico. Nico, please, uh, can you just tell us something about your take on all these issues, and then we will start with some questions. Nico. Yeah, I hope now that this uh, technically works. Thank you very much for inviting me, and it's a great pleasure to, to be here today uh, over the distance, unfortunately not in Italy, but, uh, but thank you very much for the invitation. I, I come a little bit from, um, from another side, more psychological side. And how I understand uh, design was at the beginning of my career is uh, crafting beautiful objects. And, and that was uh, what a lot of designers try to do. They had the ability uh, to find really beautiful shapes and, and great applications of um, how an object should look like. And with that there was the misperception of a lot of people that design is about making things beautiful. But, uh, but as we heard before already, uh, design is about meaning. And in the past uh, decades, design has developed much more from crafting an object into crafting the journey or the context in which the user is in. So it's not just having a beautiful object, but it's really trying to understand what, what is really the user doing with this. And especially in car design, it started that, um, that people were, were analyzed of how they're using the cars. And that's when you know, cars change their shape and they change their meaning. And you try to look for the complete journey. And with the journey, it became interesting that if somebody wants to move from A to B in an individual object, it was not just the car companies that made offerings, but also rental agencies, sharing agencies. Suddenly, other people come to the scene and they're able to offer a journey from A to B. So that opened up a race um, between car companies and, and those who are offering car services. And I think the next stage that we're coming to is building relationships. Um, building relationships between uh, the companies that are offering something and the consumers. And why is that important? We see um, that 
a lot of the services and a lot of the uh, ecosystems that we have today, um, you select them by how well they are adapted to your own needs. So behind that are not just people who can program things, but behind that are designers and the creative people and those who understand the complete need of a consumer. So what, what I find interesting is that from crafting an object to crafting the journey, we're now moving into uh, an age of crafting relationships. And I believe that uh, design and creativity are an essential part of it. There is a very interesting observation um, that, that I made that I think why designers are very important. Um, designers learn from the beginning to start with a blank sheet of paper. When they are studying, they, they start from, from nothing. And they are not afraid to think about the future, to just imagine something, to just come up with an idea and see how it works. I realize that a lot of other professions, they might also be creative, but they don't have the ability to really make up the future and to really create it. Now, the important part, and I think that's a little bit what I'm seeing in, in my own company. Um, so I work for a company, uh, BSH, uh, doing uh, um, home appliances, um, that when I see great products uh, out or a great offering um, when I go to the city or wherever, I don't necessarily look how beautiful it is designed, but I'm more asking the question, how is a company organized that creativity like this, something that really is mind-boggling, something is it totally amazes you, how is the company organized to bring this to the market? And I think that's the important bridge that from design, how it used to be, that it was just a department where something beautifully was crafted. Now design becomes much more an integrated function into the entire company. It's more of a mindset than a department. So what I find interesting is, um, especially for your topic, how does the industry need to be organized so that you can let creative people also take decisions, be part of the decision-making process, and really make a big difference throughout the entire journey from beginning to end, from the object to the service, to the digital world, to the complete ecosystems. And how do companies integrate that creative power? I think that's one of the uh, major challenges that, that a lot of companies have. Thank you. Super. Thank you, Nico. Thank you. That's very strong. Okay, I, we've heard from uh, all three of our of our panelists here. I like panelists. It sounds like a game show. Okay, so <clears throat> we've heard from all three of our uh, our associates here today, and now I'd like to um, to change the uh, pace of our of our meeting in the following format. I'll I'll send out a question to one of you. Make a brief answer on it, please, based on your how you feel about this, and then I'm going to ask the other two to uh, to react on this answer, all very briefly, so that we can move on through a number of questions. But I think this will be best, and we can get some of this done before uh, Roberto has to step out. Uh, nevertheless, I am going to start with uh, Stefano, please, with a question to you. And then the others, please listen and, uh, and make a response on what he says. Uh, Stefano, you talked about uh, the economic factors that are uh, confronting consumers regarding design, such as sharing possibilities to have other means than solely straightforward per uh, purchase. But you also talked about customization, you, where you talked about the value of design and it uh, changes based on each individual. Now we've heard from Nico the fact that a big driver for future of design is how a company is organized. So without now entering into the details of the organization of a company, what do you think about the relationship between the individual, the consumer who wants something their own way, you know, something customized, and an economy that is no longer centralized, but where many, many companies need to work jointly to provide a certain service. So what 
is the role of design in this industry in the future? You know, now we're used to one client, one customer. Is it going to be more complex? What is going to happen about this relationship? Well, this is a very, very important uh, topic. If we go back uh, to our case study and to the topic of uh, vehicles and cars, I believe that uh, today there are technologies and uh, work on materials that uh, allows us to even think of having, for instance, uh, a product, a piece of furniture that can change. I'm not talking about shapes, but certainly they can change maybe the color of a surface, depending on our desire, our uh, mood. So this topic of how to customize an object can be partially solved through a very careful and sophisticated work on building technologies. And then, of course, there's a more general issue that has to do with assembling the components of a project or an industrial product. We now know that often this assembly work happens using components and materials, raw materials that sometimes come from different parts of the world. So there is a geopolitical aspect of design that is very interesting and it's very problematic to control as well. But I think that the, these are the main challenges. In some respects, we cannot think that we can lose the idea of industrial production. We cannot really move away from uh, that uh, kind of design. But we certainly need to think of how to use advanced technologies so that we can still have the opportunity to customize products. Uh, I think that this is fundamental. This, I mean, in theory, we should uh, think of uh, uh, objects with a variable geometry. As architects, we are thinking about buildings with the variable geometries. We need uh, bedrooms that turn, as it's happened during these months, uh, that turn into working spaces, uh, that turn into spaces for video meetings, remote meetings, or uh, we need to um, have spaces in our homes for our spare time and free time. Often space uh, instead is non-variable. And uh, so that's why we need to use our imagination and our uh, creativity to think of agile furnishings that can change and have a variable geometry. So this is a very, very interesting uh, topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefano. Thank you for your answer. And I think this uh, has uh, to do, as you said, with the product, the assembly, and the use. Now, you mentioned that technology enters the object, and that plays a very important role. And maybe on this, Roberto wants to say something? Roberto, we cannot hear you. The mic is off. Yes, sorry. Sorry about that. Well, I think that the first step towards this uh, advanced customization process is uh, customer profiling, because this helps a lot in some uh, sectors. Customer profiling, even if just in large categories, gives us the chance to define uh, manufacturing and the supply chain so that we can be ready to have at least different versions on the same basis and a solution to optimize production is uh, certainly lies in the use of these advanced uh, technologies such as uh, artificial intelligence that help us a lot. On some products, this is possible, but there are other very emotional products where we still have a lot to do. I mean, I think of motorbikes, and there's still a lot to do. There, I'm sure you can find a huge customization catalogs, but we still cannot produce motorbikes that are suited to the size of the driver, as it happens with bicycles. And this is something where we'll have to think, and we'll have to do something. In the Western world, uh, motorbike drivers uh, can be 1.55 centimeters and 2.5. 10 meters, but uh, the frame of the motorbike is always the same. The automotive is sort of in between all this. If I think back of what Stefano was saying about furniture and uh, home spaces, well, there, 
We have uh, less technology related to movement, but we have to work more on materials. There are surfaces that can change their color. We have uh, materials that can have different curvatures. So, of course, designing an object, I mean, let me think of the wings of uh, an aircraft that should change a shape in order to be aerodynamic based on speed. This is extremely expensive. So maybe this kind of technology would impact on the product cost that would be much too high. So once again, we might have to find some compromises. I think back of my first kitchen, when I had my first uh, apartment, and I was quite impressed by the kitchen because it had uh, doors that had two colors, one uh, inside and one outside, but they were reversible. And I'm talking about the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s. That was quite impressive. It seemed genius to me because based on your mood, you could change the color of your kitchen covers and in order to express your mood. So, I mean, these are things where we can and we must work. Each one of us identifies with our objects and we express ourselves with our objects. That's why, that's why we feel affection for them. So it's a very sensitive topic for human beings. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roberto. Uh, I'll come back to this topic. Now, though, I will give the floor to Nico, but later from you, Roberto, I would like to hear something more about the role of digitalization in a country, because I think that this is a fundamental topic. So it's not just important how we progress, but we need to create the right context to progress, the right infrastructure. But first, I give the floor to Nico to respond to what Stefano and Roberto just said. Come ha detto, Nico è su Saturn, c'è un tempo di time delay, un lungo... Sì, scusate, ma il traduttore ha fatto un lavoro davvero bravo, quindi ho un secondo laptop qui e ho sentito la traduzione simultaneamente, quindi questo funziona bene. Sì, grazie a tutti, mi piace veramente un aspetto della compagnia che lavoro per for Robert Bosch, perché uh, Bosch non è not uh, owned by shareholders, è owned by a foundation. E il loro obiettivo non è not maximizing profit, ma è di migliorare le vite delle persone around the world. That's è il loro highest motive. E quando parliamo di uh, tecnologia e individualizzazione e customizzazione, We are very much trying to identify what could really improve people's lives uh, and, and, and what is it that uh, really is meaningful and not just a gadget. Um, and, and there are a couple of topics because we understand that uh, now for, for home appliances, um, cooking and food and nutrition, these are very individual topics uh, with every culture in the world. And everybody has a different idea of what they want to cook and how they want to host friends and and what they can then do to, to improve, to do that better. And I really like the idea uh, in the past years that uh, the, the digitalization has helped a great deal uh, to improve people's lives. And, and that could be very simple things. I, I really like the simple example of a, of a scale Uh, now, when you're measuring something, and, and normally a scale would show you like 300 grams of sugar. What you can do today is you can say measure 300 calories of sugar. Now, and it gives you immediately an answer of how much sugar you need to pour. That means in the background, you need to have a lot of technology working and, and you need to have a back end. You need to have all of that information flowing. And, and that's just a very simple example of where technology today is helping consumers um, to, to have an enriched experience, for example, in cooking and, and to, to really craft it to their own needs, their recipes, uh, learning recipes and, and learning their nutritional needs and, and if they have uh, dietary requirements. So all of these things are not happening by themselves, but they require creative people who are able to observe really well what consumers need, and then I've come up with great ideas. So we are constantly immersing ourselves in all kinds of different technologies, but the most important part of the designer is not the observation part, it's the sense-making part. Where does that make sense? And where can you contribute um, to the consumer having a better experience or having a, a, a better life? 
This, uh, this is very important, sense-making for consumers. And this brings to mind, Nico, that I started in the world of automotive at the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, when we had the oil crisis. And one of the first uh, things that we did was thinking that a new indicator didn't really need to go up, you know, when you're looking at the speed, but we needed an indicator that would go down because it could show fuel consumption. Fuel consumption indicator was new, but it works the opposite way. So we had to make sense between these two things. We wanted an indicator that went up, and when it was about fuel consumption, we wanted an indicator that would go down. Now, thank you very much. Uh, I think that we've already um, touched upon very interesting points. Now I would like to ask a question to Roberto. I was mentioning digitalization. Now, of course, it helps consumers. This is very clear, and it's extremely important. But I think you have an insight on the fact that it's even more important to create the right context to manufacture products and develop design. We need a digitalization basis, and we need much more than what we now have in Italy. And I think this is an important message. It's not just necessary to create a fighter aircraft tomorrow because that needs a lot of processing power, but we also, you know, we have a disseminated population of designers in Italy. This is very true in Italy. How can all these disseminated designers benefit from the digital revolution? Again, can you turn the mic on, please? Sorry, I can't be jet lagged. I mean, it seems like I have a jet lag in activating and enabling my mic. Sorry about that. This is an extremely important aspect. First of all, we cannot talk about uh, the digitalization without looking at what the situation is like right now. I would love one day to live in a country where we have a high performance computing and cloud infrastructure that is well established, a cloud that can be accessible to everyone. And I would like to live in a country where we'll have a data transmission system that is wireless, like a 5G or a similar system that really allows us to have a particularly agile internet of things with uh, very low latency times. I would love to live in a country with uh, uh, wide band in all homes. We don't necessarily need fiber. I can think of Germany, for instance. We have about 60 uh, percent who are in favor in using metal cables and not necessarily fibers. But still, all citizens have a good band. We should ensure 200 megabits per second to everyone in order to follow video classes and uh, interact, etc. That should be ensured to all families. If we had such a digital substrate in an advanced country, and let me be clear, such an infrastructure costs 30 billions over three years. It's not something that can be improvised. But if we have that substrate, then I think it would be a great opportunity because in that infrastructure, and I'm referring to Italy in particular, we could really nurture and grow 20,000 digital developers. This is particularly true for Italy. They could find a very fertile context. Uh, Italians have a creative DNA. I often say it from uh, the perspective of neurosciences, it's very reasonable. It's not a genetic thing. It's a matter of uh, cultural heritage. We grow in a country where we have 70% of the historical and architectural beauty of the planet. We study beauty in school. We study maybe less mathematics, but we study human sciences, and we see beauty all around us, more than in other countries, maybe. So we do have a life experience that makes us uh, fueled with beauty, and uh, by developing further skills, such as mathematics and languages, this makes us genetically, although it's got nothing to do with biology and genetics, but it makes us more creative than many other colleagues from other countries. This creativity today with digitalization is accelerated. We were saying it before. It's not just a matter of having the right intuition to draw, but we need the right tools to visualize in 3D things that otherwise you had 
you could only draw on a piece of paper. Today, giving an inventor, a digital designer, or a creative person the ability to be fully immersed in an augmented reality, in a virtual reality, is something that goes beyond the sensory experience of people, and it's something that gives creative people and designers the chance of being infinitely more performing than it happened in the past. So I think that a great challenge for Italy would be that of saying, you see, today we have 70,000 people who are at large in research and development. They're not all designers, but many of them must also be designers. It can be chemical, physical design. It doesn't necessarily have to be the design we're talking about today, but we should reach 120,000 designers to be at the same level as countries with a similar size and a similar GDP. And Italy should be able to exploit this enormous creativity, given and especially young talents, the brushes of the 21st century, the brushes, the pencils of the 21st centuries are bits. They're not graphite pencils or, in other words, I mean, of course, we use pencil and we write down what we think, but then you need to be able to translate this idea into simulation and augmented reality. I think that this would create well-being, GDP, and it would possibly create a happier society as well. I think that uh, beauty that comes from design, from smart products, is something that uh, citizens breathe. They're happy to have uh, this around us, and you know, you become happier that you live in a country that is able to produce such beauty. Roberto, this is a very nice perspective on the situation, and it's a fundamental mental before I ask a question to others I would like to make a comment on this you know on the fact that we are in Italy it is important that's why I've asked Nico to come here from Germany because it can give us a perspective from the outside which I believe is extremely important too because he lives in a country that Roberto just mentioned you know the level of technology per citizens for all citizens is much higher I'd like to you know tell you a little story I found a designer, maybe one of the most uh, <coughs> creative and innovative designers and the uh, most uh, technologically advanced designers that I've ever known, and he had a degree in Italy in classic humanities, in classic literature. This basis in classic literature gave this guy more strength in design because so much of design has to do with semantics. If you understand semantics, then you have a very important resource to then use technology. And once again, this is part of Italian culture and of other countries too, but it is something that, for instance, I didn't have in the United States. So it's something that I see and I find very important. Now, on what Roberto said, Stefano, do you want to make a comment? And then I'll pass the floor to Nico for the third question. But Stefano first. The mic is off, sorry. Should be on now. I fully agree with what Roberto just uh, said. I believe that, just to make one reference, I mean, yesterday on Corriere della Sera, Francesco Giavazzi wrote a very interesting and clear article and he said that uh, we cannot overcome these uh, situations only thanks to European funding or public funding, but we need to imagine uh, the involvement of creativity and of private companies, which in Italy play a fundamental role. Let's just think of our exports. Exporting Italian products uh, often uh, depends on what uh, Roberto said, you know, the aesthetic values, or in general terms, what we call beauty, which uh, truly means, uh, you know, performance uh, and uh, that concept of simplicity that Roberto mentioned in the beginning. Italian products are able to be, at the same time, essential, full of potentials, and also they have a additional symbolic value. And I think that this is uh, very true for the automotive sector, but it's uh, true for design at large, for fashion, uh, food, uh, everything that we are able to produce and create, often with uh, mass-produced products, but still with a great sensitivity, uh, and uh, which makes them competitive in the world. Thank you. Nico. Your turn. Uh, and then I'm going to come back to you with a, with a, a follow-up question. 
In all of this, uh, uh, Roberto will have to pop out at one minute, so we know that we have to go, don't worry, and then you'll come back again. Nico, what Roberto and Stefano said, I mean, any comments, uh, your perspective on what they've just said? Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Uh, and I think, uh, Roberto, you make a very important point. I think uh, in, in the types of designers that you need in a society, I, I definitely believe that, you know, you will continue to need people that craft beautiful objects that are able to create fashion that is desirable and nobody has ever seen before. Um, and I think that can be the specialty of a country that that you are being known for a certain craft or a certain style. And what is important in in design, whenever I I look, I I try to explain uh, design. It's about two things. One is success. Everybody wants design to be successful in a company, and the other one is leadership. That's what sometimes they're not so interested in because it costs money. So. What I find important is that you are finding the talent that is not only successful, but that also can create leadership, that can create differentiation, something that is unique, where you are the first. And that is so desirable that people also outside of your area, your country, um, want to have it. Uh, that's what makes um, design uh, desirable. Now, the interesting thing comes when we are talking about digitalization. With objects, we have a very long culture of cars and furniture, fashion and everything. But when it comes to digital, our culture is not that developed and we are actually not fast enough. And I'd, I'd like to pour a little bit of, of water into your wine. Uh, I, I lived in Asia for, for many years. And, and also now when I'm visiting China, the degree of speed how they are implementing digital solutions into the daily lifestyle is absolutely amazing. They are so much faster than the West. Now, the question is always, does that make sense? Maybe they are not asking that question. It's just possible. But we have to be really in the digital uh, arena, be careful that we are fast enough because the adaptation of consumers in Europe is much slower to these possibilities than in Asia. So we have to find the right balance between uh, educating the consumers of what the true benefit is, but also keeping up with, with the pace of the digital life. And I believe that what's very important, and, and Silvio mentioned that in his speech, entry speech, is we need to nurture the talent uh, that will do all of this. We need to make sure that the universities, uh, that they that they are bringing up people who can keep up this pace. And we also, also need to see that those students don't just see Italy, but that they travel the world and that they especially understand also what's going on in Asia uh, and that they bring back that experience and then know how to adapt it to uh, to the to the work that they are doing. So I think that's very important that we're looking to young people, the next generation, those who grow up with this already, and that we use the creative energy to find a good answer of what our digital culture could be in the future. Okay, that's very nice. Thank you. Uh, uh, I really appreciate your answer. There's a lot of food for thought. Uh, I was particularly interested when you said that success and leadership are two very important things in uh, design and in the industrial world, but they are quite different because success usually means money in and leadership means money out. You need to spend in order to be ahead of others. I can easily understand that. And I would like to expand the discussion today and move beyond design. We are in a context today where we see a lot of factionalism, a lot of populism, etc., with uh, many different uh, factors in the world. And I mean, the concept of truth has become very difficult for people to grasp it's difficult for 
the government. I mean, now we're living in the COVID uh, time. Governments have COVID uh, programs, and this happens all over the world, in Italy and other countries. So governments decide that we should do this or that. And then, you know, all of a sudden you have people that say, but that's not true. We can't believe you. There are different versions. Uh, uh, we don't have so many deaths, etc. So it seems that... Uh, we are doubting fundamental things. People wonder, is this true or not? And this is a problem for populations all over the world. And that's because of social media, because they are a platform for those who have alternative opinions. But there are maybe other factors as well. There might be, you know, people who want to create a certain turbulence. Now, the thing is that design is... Uh, in the middle of the relationship that we have with society. It's not just about the objects that we use, but how we use them, their meaning for us. Nico said it before, he talked about meaning. Design is meaning. So in a world where it's more and more difficult to find a solid basis for meaning in our lives, what can designers do? Uh, let alone, you know, cars or objects. Are we here only to promote consumerism or are we here to give something more to people and to governments? Are we here to make society stabler, maybe, thanks to design? Do you see a role of designers in this? Uh, Nico, we'll start with you and then I'll give the floor to the other guests. Thank you very much, Chris. I think um, when uh, you know Silvio is, is listening as well, if you sit in a Ferrari and you accelerate, that's very true. So, uh, <laughs> so that's very true. But <laughs> but putting that joke aside, I think one of the most important elements is that people are looking for trust. Who can they trust? And I think that a lot of companies uh, that have a good brand name. Um, people trust them. So, you know, when you go to the supermarket and you're buying uh, some some cereal or something, you, you look at the back of the package and you're trying to find out, well, how much sugar is really in that? You know, are they really telling me this is low sugar and suddenly you see, hey, they're, they're not telling me the truth. That's not true. Um, so I think what you need to do as companies or as brands is to to, to build up that trust and to keep that trust. And, and that trust can be easily lost. Um, and what I find important is that uh, designers who are crafting that experience, that they're always looking for something that is meaningful and that you can trust. And that means that the way how you build products, uh, what kind of materials you use, how it looks, what it promises to you, how long it will last, uh, will be very important uh, to consumers. And I'm making a good example. We have a, a lot of uh, European regulations on circular economy and and how people are using the products and when they're throwing the products away and they don't, use, don't need it anymore. I think we will have a huge responsibility as designers in the next coming decades to build up that trust for consumers that they can consume products and services uh, without having to sacrifice and they will look to us that we are crafting that experience with a good conscience in mind. So for me, one of the most important things to do in, in, the, in the next coming years is that companies need to build up their trust. They need to build up transparency. They need to be honest about their offerings so that consumers can lean back and say, oh, I don't trust that, that brand. They will do the right thing. And if you can say that, I think the the creative offering that you show is a successful one. Stefano, what do you think? Uh, by the way, I have to apologize, but I have a class, a remote lesson at the Polytechnic very soon, a different way of communicating. 
which is uh, something on which we'll have to work a lot, uh, you know, how we can design spaces for communication in a future where the proximity of bodies uh, possibly will not always be that easy. Sorry, I'm not trying to avoid the question, but uh, I think that this is also a very important topic. We have to think about the proximity of bodies and realize that it won't always be a given condition. It's also a value to safeguard, though, because there are many variables that we cannot give up, but it's true that technology today gives us the chance to work in the spaces where even though we are not present, we are still able to convey the variety of expressions and of gestures which are often so important when you are physically present. So, uh, sorry, I have to go. I thank you very much because, as I said, I have a lesson at university. It's been very interesting. Estriennale, we are here and we are very interested in participating in this discussion. So, thank you very much. Thank you once again to Chris, Nico and Roberto. Thank you. I am Giampaolo Manzella. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, sorry, I haven't introduced you. Um, I was taken aback a little bit. I wasn't expecting you now, but welcome, welcome. Thank you. Now, first of all, we started a discussion with Nico and the other panelists, so I would like to uh, still talk about a couple of points. You are Under Secretary of State for Economic Development, and it's quite important to have your opinion on some of the things that we've talked about. So welcome and thank you very much for joining us. I thought you were taking the floor later, but still, thank you for being uh, here and for participating in the discussion as well. Perfect. Thank you. I don't mind. I can take the floor now. I mean, creativity is a topic that is very interesting for me. Well, then you've joined it at the right time. I've asked Nico as how design can help governments. And Nicole basically explained that uh, economy based on transparency and trust building is uh, very important for companies and it is the most important thing. Oh yes, I've been listening to you, great. So can you give us your opinion and your perspective on this aspect? It would be very interesting. Well, I think that Nico highlighted a very important point on the role of designers and their role within the life of a company. I think that in also have a problem in integrating designers in public life. I think that the issue of trust and the issue of transparency, the two issues that you raised, the two aspects that you mentioned, well, trust and leadership have to do with the public sector. Uh, in fact, they are two deep problems of the public sector right now. And so it's not by chance that at this time the OSCE, for instance, when they talk about uh, the public service of the future, says that they believe that uh, the public services of the future must uh, have product designers and service designers included in public administrations. In other words, we have citizens who are used to receiving services from the public sector because of data, because of competition, so they receive customized services from the private sector. So either we build a public administration that is able to keep the pace and provide equally customized services or the level of trust between citizens and the public sphere will decrease and there will be a gap between the public and the private sector with the consequences that we know. We could see populist movements, for instance, as we are already seeing. It's a matter of politics, too. It's not just a matter of economics, in other words. Well, I think that you've touched upon a very important point. Again, the role of design as a service 
to the public, to citizens. Nico was in Singapore for a long time. I was also in Singapore. And the uh, request of the government, they have a design council in Singapore and uh, it had the task of bringing design as a fundamental economic factor for Singapore. That's how design is seen in Singapore. There was a lot of interest from the government in Singapore towards design. It wasn't necessarily a ministry, but it's very close to a ministry. It's a, a council. Now, do you think that we could have the chance of having an, an official recognition of design? Are you from the UK, Mr. Bangor? No, from the United States. All right, United States. The Design Council was created in the UK in 1944. It was called Council for Industrial Design. And it was created by the Winston Churchill government to give an impulse to the British industry and in particular to British exports. Not much later, the United Kingdom also created some specific programs dedicated to bringing design into public services. I think that's, you know, a very advanced experience. A country like Singapore, supported by a flourishing economic situation, a strong economic state, and also supported by a uh, political system that is able to guide public administration with great strength because we cannot forget that Singapore has an extremely effective public and efficient public administration so it doesn't surprise me that design and creativity plays such an important role uh, in Singapore at the public level if, I, if I'm not mistaken this was part of a reform of the public sector that was geared towards following the private sector. They called it new public management about 20 years ago, if I'm not mistaken. So I believe that, I mean, what we're working on in Italy is a fund to support creative companies. This is just the beginning of a process. These resources, this fund, will help the creation of creative companies. And, as many of you said, it will help creating a bridge between designers and traditional companies. We need creative professionals that enter traditional companies and somehow break traditional patterns that uh, companies are used to so that they can improve uh, the ability to penetrate new markets and so on and so forth. I am putting forward another suggestion. I know in Germany they have the Center of Excellence for Culture and Creative Industries or something like that which is a body of about 25 people who are in Berlin and they analyze how much creative, uh, well, German creative industries are worth and they analyze how the potential of creativity can be transferred to German industries. I think that we also need an additional part we need to transfer creativity to the public sector too. This is another step that I think is necessary. The public sector uh, has its reputation at stake. We need the trust of citizens. That's what is at stake and this is what we need. But to answer your question, we are starting a process. This budget law, I think, could be a turning point. Well, I've appreciated your answer. Thank you very much. And this has inspired me. So thank you very much. A question to Nico. But before, we have Silvio with us again. Silvio Angori. I've asked him to join us again. 
Silvio, can you tell us about the experience in Singapore? You know, a government together with designers has created opportunities for their industries, the private sector. You were there, right? You were in the front line. Sorry. So, the question was for you. Do you want me to repeat it in English or did you get the translation? No, that's fine. No, that's fine. I just, uh, I was just, um, sorry, I was just on mute again. The, the old traditional thing that everybody is on mute when they want to say something. Um, no, th th thank you, Signora Mandela, for, for uh, bringing that up and, and you're very well informed. That's really great. Um, because I see the, gr the opportunity uh, in Singapore was that um, the government saw that through uh, creative programs, they raised what Chris actually put at that point, the literacy of people in creativity. Um, and a little bit, uh, Singapore had, had an issue that uh, it is a, is a very academic driven education system in which creativity did not really have its room to, to flourish. And that's why they also try to bring much more creativity and services and, and design studios to Singapore to be able to educate people in creativity and to, to offer that as, uh, as a, um, as in, on university. And they actually, for the small state of Singapore, they had five universities teaching design and creativity, graphic design, architecture, urban design and so on, because they realized that in a purely academic uh, learning environment that they will not bring up the people who are thinking about these things in the future. So I had the ch chance to, to be in the supervisory board of some of these schools. And what was interesting, I asked them, now, how do you pick your designers and, and to, for your schools? And they said, oh, they need to have good grades. And, and I said, yeah, but design is not being good in math or anything else. It's being creative. So how many people can also study design based on their skills? And they said, oh, about 20%. And then I asked, who were the ones who performed the best? And they said, oh, those were the ones who came in, you know, with, with their portfolio, with, with a creative mindset. This means to me, you need to really nurture uh, creativity from the very beginning. You cannot just click like this and, and suddenly a country is, is creative. And I think you mentioned the UK Design Council. Um, we had a similar council in Germany, the Rat für Formgebung. I, I just looked it up. They were founded in 1953. Their first project was actually with the Triennale in, in Milano. So that was uh, interesting. Um, but what I find important is that the, the space where, where government and the public sector, where they come together, starts with education. And I think um, what, you can, what you can do and what I know from experience is that the design education in Italy has gone through a lot of different cycles, but is now at a point where um, people really understand what they can study, that they don't have to go through like complicated academic studies, but that they can jump straight into uh, creative studies and I think once you nourish that you will have a great fund of creative people in the future to 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 exactly change that that situation that's, that's important Grazie. thank you uh, thank you thank you thank you for this uh, further comments on Singapore as well the I have my first experience in Italy was in 85 when I joined Fiat and I remember that the word designer wasn't even known, it didn't exist, there were no designers, you had architects and other figures but there were no designers, now we do. Silvio, thank you for being back with us. Now we this, what we discussed with Mr. Manzella and Nico is fundamental for Anfia as well, isn't it? So what do you think? Thank you, Chris, and thanks once again to all of you for the opportunity. I've listened with great interest to what's been said about Italian creativity. I 
utilizzano i designer come ovviamente um, un fattore di natura economica, no? I see design as an economic uh, factor. I'm not a designer, I work for a company. And as an association, we also want to make sure that this uniqueness is acknowledged in the world. It is true that Italian design is what makes us stand out. Often we need to have some accreditation plans for young designers so that they can use the years they spent in Italy, learning about Italian taste, and maybe they can go abroad afterwards. Often, with our associate members, we say that in an academic approach, it's important to make sure that designers have a truly distinctive and unique kind of education. We wonder, why don't we have a public register of designers? We have a public register of architects, for instance, or we have public registers of other professionals. Maybe, do we need a public register of designers? It could be a way to uh, guarantee that many Italian and foreign talents who come here to Italy to learn the taste for beauty, that they have an extra tool, an extra instrument, so that they are somehow certified or acknowledged uh, for their competencies and skills. So we will often think about the possibility of building an official register of designers with the help of a design council. I said it in my uh, introduction, I would like to see a ministry for design and uh, made in Italy with uh, Mr. Manzella. We talked about it recently as well. But I mean, this should be part of a system that uh, gives uh, companies the chance to compete thanks to their unique characteristics because it's our uniqueness that can create also the economic growth and uh, wealth of companies and our country too. Well, thank you. We have Roberto again with us, I think. There is. There is. We've talked about the role of designers, designers and citizens, the relationship between designers and the state and governments. I would like to ask you about your experience in the combination between designers and government. I mean, this sort of marriage, does it create opportunities? You have a lot of experience of working with the government. So this combination, what can it create? Do you have anything to add on this topic? Well, thank you, Chris. My experience is the experience of a university professor who at one point in his career decided to resign from university because the state was asking me to create a foundation for the development of advanced technology, the Italian Institute for Technology. Now, this is a model that is very new in Italy, but if you look at the German case, and I think that Nico can confirm this, uh, much of the research and development in many, many sectors is... Uh, the outcome of the great cooperation between the public and private sector, so companies and universities, etc. University like the Max Planck or Fraunhofer Gesellschaften, but it, uh, Max Planck is more fundamental research, but I mean, we have the Leibniz uh, Gesellschaft and, 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 and so on and so forth. They are sort of a bridge and a driver. They make sure that a curiosity driven research and development can be better developed 
per il comparto industriale. Addirittura And c'è become usable che, uh, by companies. The Fraunhofer Institute, through the funding from Lender, develops a research that otherwise companies should develop by themselves. It's a complementary system. It doesn't take anything away from universities. It's something that uh, gives uh, more potential to young people, young talents. They can grow. So it doesn't replace university. It's a complement. The research and development in technology and design, because I think it is part of research and development, well, I think that uh, our Italian model, unfortunately, is often hindered by bureaucracy. We have uh, a very heavy bureaucracy and that uh, prevents us from following the right timing. It takes months for us often to look for a researcher. You know, if a project uh, is a three year, takes three years, I can't spend eight months uh, hiring a researcher because that's almost one third of the entire project time. This is a big problem, for instance, but uh, a foundation can be much leaner and much quicker. It can work almost as a company. So in comparison to state procedures and state bureaucracy, it is faster, it is quicker, more agile, and uh, we have a little bit more flexibility than entirely public bodies. This is not just an Italian problem. I'm thinking of NASA. NASA, and I mean, it is a, a huge infrastructure. At one point, NASA was so complicated and slow to manage that it preferred funding some very advanced uh, developments to Elon Musk or others, uh, sort of outsourced it, because NASA was begun, beginning to uh, become too slow and heavy. And and the risk is that you crumble under your own weight, and this is what often happens with public institutions. So, yes, we have this interaction between public and private. It is fundamental for training, for education, for sustainability. It is essential to have a supply chain based on mutual respect. And, uh, the, for example, one aspect I would change is the systems of PhD. It's not in line with the needs of industrial production. It's just it's a path to have a career in academia. We need something different. But luckily, there are virtuous examples around the world, so we don't need to come up with new things. We can just take inspiration from good practices. We have some of the best human capital still, it won't be true forever. So if we don't change things fast enough, we risk losing our great resource, our human capital. But we need new things to preserve this competitive advantage. And this is something that we need to keep in mind. I recently talked to Mr. Manzella and we discussed it as well. We need to find the ways to break some old mechanisms and change them. Thank you, Roberto. We have about 30 minutes left, but there's one thing that we all said. So, one thing that nobody would like to do is to suggest a strategy to win the war. And I think that when we talk about design, often people don't understand that we need to adapt the education and training of young talents and young people moving away from the past. We need to look at the future. And often we are not able to see where we go. We need to think of the future rather than designing young people's education on the basis of what, uh, of what we did in the past. So, this is my question to Mr. Manzella and then to the others if they want to answer as well. This, 
We've often talked about technology and art. We know that cars have been reinvented three times in Italy alone. I mean, we, Italy has reinvented many, many things in cars as well. My question is the following. Do we need to create a new philosophy of design, a philosophy that is not just... Chris, you're torturing plastic. No. To, to torture plastics, to create a shape and have a certain function, so it's not just about that, but this is what we talked about today. Do we need to change the philosophy of design? You know, it's not just a matter of working on plastics and materials. And this, this philosophy of design is something that we can integrate in people's education. So it, this is my question. Do we need a new philosophy of design, which might come from Italy, Mr. Manzella? I don't know whether we should really use the term philosophy of design. I am not a designer, I'm passionate about design and I follow the debate and I think that uh, the approach of design is widely accepted as a, you know, being about processes, uh, as being a human being centered. We now know about eco-design. I think that's now recognized. There is a new centrality in design, and that's the reason why I believe that design is the most cross-sector creative uh, industry. It is the most political one, if you want, because it really ranges from products to sustainability, public services, etc. Embracing an idea of creativity and design and innovation as a driver for development of a country means that we have to turn everything upside down. We have to completely change how this country educates its young people, its uh, children, how a country organizes public administration, what sectors we bet on and we support. It changes how a country manages the relationship between research centers and companies, the type of support that we give to traditional companies in order to move towards something new. I mean, it's really a uh, turning point and a revolutionary uh, change. I think that a country like Italy, which paradoxically, I think Nico said it before, Italy is seen in the world as the country of creativity, as the country of made in Italy products, of cross-pollination. But at this uh, turning point, we are struggling. So for people who are in politics and feel this need, well, I think that they need to work in order to make sure that creativity becomes part of the system, one of the prerequisites of the system, a creative economy, creative society, we need a creative education, that should be part of, uh, I mean the adjective, the word creative should uh, be part of everything, of uh, our entire system, and this is what we are beginning to do. 
As I said, we've created this fund for creative companies. We have the new Industry 4.0 plan that has specific measures to support spending in design. We are going to focus on creative companies, but I mean, these are resources and that's one thing, but we also need to be fully aware of the meaning of the revolutionary role of the creativity and innovation which often go hand in hand. Thank you. Roberto. And then I will ask uh, Silvio and Nico as well. But I come back to you because we talked a lot in the past about the role of technology and job security in a way. We talked about how we moved from a time where there were many jobs for people who wanted to work eight hours a day and then go back home with a paycheck. And that was it. But it wasn't a gig economy approach where, you know, now I'm happy that I can find a micro job with a micro payment. But in the past, uh, we had masses of people who had uh, nine to five uh, jobs and a paycheck at the end of the month. So when I talk about the philosophy of design, I also refer to the fact that with design, we can maybe create new job opportunities that are not just advanced technology jobs. What do you think about this? Well, I think that this is uh, extremely important. In the past 100 years, we've seen uh, technologies entering everybody's lives, the TV. I mean, it took 30 years for televisions to be present in 25% uh, uh, homes of America. And the same is true for the telephone. Now, what does that mean? It means that innovative technologies that change the way of communicating, of living and working have become widespread and widely accepted uh, over the average working time of a worker. So, you know, uh, schools and in companies could adapt. This has always happened since the beginning of Homo sapiens up until a few years ago. But the latest technologies are very different. I'm thinking of smartphones or uh, the internet. Uh, or the digital world, all these technologies have exploded. Their cycles are five, seven years long, not 35. So for us workers, our working life is more or less 35, 40 years. Now the risk is that during our working life, we see four or five different technology paradigms. So we might soon become dinosaurs and become obsolete. So of course, we study when we are 18, when we are 20, 22. That knowledge should last until the day of our retirement. That's no longer true because in the meantime, technologies explode, business models change, communications changes. This is a fundamental problem. It's the dark side of technology. And this is causing huge problems that we cannot ignore, especially for the most fragile workers, those who have a lower uh, cultural background, you know, more routine jobs. It is a problem. Of course, we need to think about this aspect. First of all, we need to think think of the most fragile workers, routine workers, and there we need an alliance between the public and the private sphere to make sure that uh, workers can be continuously updated. This is only possible if the two sectors, the public and the private one, cooperate. I strongly believe in uh, this. Uh, it's not a solution to all problems, but it's certainly a way to mitigate uh, the problem of becoming obsolete as workers because of the the speed of new technologies. Second, we need to open up as much as possible to creative jobs because creative jobs never get old. Quite the opposite, uh, they improve uh, the way we experience technologies. And of course, design is one of these creative uh, jobs. As we mentioned today, by design, we don't just mean drawing 
a car, but it's about conceiving an adaptive system with new materials using completely different technologies, such as the super processors and the cloud. It's a completely new way of obtaining what we called simplicity in the beginning. Simplifying a complex system where drawing and function are uh, tightly connected, where a drawing is the driver of technology, they're not separate. I've never built cars in my life, I've never designed cars in my life, but uh, I've always enjoyed it. I realize that often, uh, and, and I love Ferraris, and I see that often you need to find a balance between what designers want and what engineers want. But I think that in the future, we'll have a virtuous process when design will become the first step of engineering, because then shape, form and function will be intertwined. And this is a way to mitigate the aging of workers faced with the growth of technologies. You've concluded with a very clear word, you know, design the first step of engineering. That's very interesting. One of the classic definitions of design is that design solves problems, but it's not true. Engineers solve, engineering solves the problems. Design finds problems. I mean, if you have a phone, it's a new problem. May, may I just, uh, just say, uh, to me, design is beyond all this. Uh, in the COVID situation, we've seen a lot of acceleration in the development of vaccines and some drugs as well. This comes from the fact that with the uh, power of processing that we have now, we can simulate in an accurate way a drug. You take millions of atoms, you put them together and you calculate let's say a protein, and you can calculate the interaction of this protein with another thousand uh, atoms that are the molecule of the drug. So you do simulated biology, just as you simulate the crash test of a car, you can simulate drugs. This is design because it can accelerate the development of a drug saving millions of uh, euro or dollars because uh, you don't test the drug on people, but you simulate it. Once that you know that the structure of a car can get five stars in crash tests uh, in the simulation. Well, that's true also for a vaccine. In the simulation, if you know that the vaccine will work in the simulation, you know, that's what works. And that's what I mean, it's a revolution. It's more than a revolution. That's, yes, thank you. We have uh, just a few minutes left and then we will close. I, but I don't want to leave this idea of philosophy aside. I give the floor to Nico now and then we will conclude with Silvio. So we only have a few minutes left, but Nico, on this philosophy of design, which requires a new way of educating to design. You have to change the education to design, looking at the future and not just looking at the past. Now, how do you think that we can progress? How do you think we can move forward? Yeah, I, I think, Silvio, in the beginning, you made a very good point. You know, we're all in a crisis right now and we need to look into opportunities. And what are those opportunities? I think the crisis will accelerate a couple of things and it will also change a couple of things. Um, there's an unfortunate thing, of course, that a lot of people that are in the creative business, um, they had difficulties in the crisis to, to sustain their jobs and, and to, to do their work. So it takes a lot to bring uh, that confidence back to, to these people, especially the creative people that are not employed in big companies, but that are making a living just by by working for other companies. So I think you need to first bring back some sort of confidence in people, because what I mentioned earlier, design is, is, is about thinking what could be in the future. And to do so, you need to be daring. You need to be daring to imagine the future. And daring always has an element of risk taking. It's not coming from safety, what we always did, but it's coming from risk taking. And I think the role that the government can play is that you bring back confidence to people 
and that you encourage them to be entrepreneurs, uh, to to be um, open to change, to to new ideas, to fostering creativity. Because what Roberto mentioned earlier, uh, organizations like Fraunhofer in, in Germany, they are huge organizations. Um, but I think there's also something else which you, of course, also have are startup companies, companies that um, are bringing an idea to life. And what I think is important that the government tries to support these people to cut down the red tape and bureaucracy and to to promote creativity and to make sure that creativity has a, a place in in the public um, in the public domain, and that it can also make a difference. And the the difference I think that it makes to Italy will be a very different one than to to Germany or UK or different countries in the world. You need to have your own flavor and your own culture to it, which I think uh, you have already from the past. But you need to project that into the future. And I think that's where the private sector and public sector and government can really closely collaborate together, bring that confidence back and try to support entrepreneurial thinking and creative thinking, which I think is the most important, what we need, especially after the crisis. Fantastic. Nico, grazie. That was fantastic. Thank you, Nico. That was fantastic. Now, we are now, we have now reached the end of our time. I would like, uh, before I give the floor to Silvio for his uh, conclusions and then to Mr. Mazzella, I would like to thank our guests uh, today, Roberto Cingolani. Thank you very much for being with us. I know you're very, very busy, so thank you for finding the time to be with us and answer our questions. Thank you to Nico von Zauma. Thank you, thank you very much. Even if you were on Mars or Saturn or whatever planet you were on, you know, from the planet of a different language and with a time delay, but thank you very much. Thank you for your insights. Thank you all. Thank you to Stefano. It's been very interesting to have you, even though he's not with us now, but thank you. Thank you. It's been great to spend time with you. Thank you. Uh, thanks to Stefano, even though he's not here now. Uh, now, I give the floor now to Silvio Angori for a conclusion. And then Mr. Manzella. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And thank you all. I would like to explain a paradox that impressed me when I was a student many, many years ago. On the first page of my book, on uh, physics, uh, there was a sentence attributed to a great mathematician who said about one of his students at the Heidelberg University, he said, well, he is uh, a great artist, uh, a great painter. He hadn't enough creativity to become a mathematician. He was a student who had then changed uh, his path. So this is a paradox, you know, someone who is not creative enough to be a good mathematician. And this, I often mention it when I talk to flexibility and creativity with my colleagues. These are topics that we've mentioned. Uh, Mr. Cingolani talked uh, about it, but also Stefano and Nico talked about uh, uh, this. The importance of education and the uh, importance of learning that we have to learn all life long. This is what our companies need. Technological changes are so quick now that we really need to be able to learn in real time and continuously, otherwise we'll be excluded from the economic cycle. That's why we really need to have an exchange between academia and the research world and the world of companies. Uh, Italian design companies are very small in Italy. We certainly have problems of size that prevents us from investing large amounts in a continuous education. So in order to avoid that this great uh, cultural heritage is dispersed or lost, we need to work in tight cooperation with the public sector. We need the attention of politics. And it is key in order to have a successful future. I'm very happy that we've had your participation. Thank you very much on behalf of ANFIA for your contribution and your participation. So really, thank you to all these exceptional panelists. Thank you to Mr. Manzella as well. And I would like to give him the floor for a final word.
Well, first of all, I've been very, very happy to be here with you today and I particularly appreciated um, this uh, creative approach to the discussion. You know, I was supposed to take the floor at the end. I was very happy to be given the opportunity to take the floor before and participate in the discussion as well. I think uh, that uh, uh, we've really touched upon one of the Italian problems. We need to better integrate advanced worlds like creativity, design, technology and uh, in public administration. We mentioned Singapore before. Well, you know, Singapore has a ministry for the future. Sweden has it as well. There are countries in the world where they, a ministry thinks about the future of a country. And so all the variables are connected to really think about the future. Demographic variables, but also innovation or the competitive advantages that we have or how public administrations need to change. All these aspects are taken into account to really think of a possible future. Of course, in, at such a time, designers should play a very important role. They are controllers of all these variables, of course, helped by big data and helped by technology. But I do think that we are at an historical time when design has a core role. It's very different from what design was in the 50s or 60s. It's not just about products, but design is really able to read phenomena, anticipate the future, and understand what needs to be activated in order to make products and to move forward. As I mentioned, we've started to work, we've created this fund for creative industries. We have uh, earmarked resources for creative companies for, from an economic and financial perspective. I think that there are many opportunities for those who work in the world of design. But we need to do something more. We need to bring creativity to schools because the world is telling us that uh, we need to teach creative skills to kids. So this is a very important thing to do. But also we need to help creativity access the world of enterprise. And we need to help companies uh, integrate this. I was uh, during the PMI days, I mean, it's the day where we celebrate small and medium enterprises. Uh, we had a connection with Miami. And I remember that from Miami, we had the head of Pininfarina in the United States, uh, Mr. De Soler, I think it's his name. Now, the interesting thing was to see how a design that comes from car making in the United States is applied to so many different things, watches or uh, urban furnishings or even stadiums and so on and so forth. And that comes from the world of car making. So you see in the United States, there's this flexibility of design. I would like to close by saying that as a ministry, I'm very busy and I'm very interested in this topic. And I think that we will be able to overcome this crisis only through a cultural change of companies as well. We need innovation, new technologies and creativity. So if we will have this cultural shift, then we will be able to overcome the crisis. We are talking about a fundamental aspect of the modernization of our country. We are seeing very fast innovation right now. The public administration must be supported to speed up its pace. And uh, you have uh, the duty of stimulating us and motivating us to speed up the pace and keep up the pace with the new technologies 
and the new mindset of innovation and development. Uh, with creativity and design, I think that we are at the front line of this change. They are drivers of change. Thank you. So thank you once again. Thank you all. And enjoy the rest of your um, evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you.